My name is Paul O'Donnell, President of the EACA, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to a new regular content series called Advertising Europe, where we will explore some of the key issues affecting our industry across the region. Now, as the EACA, our spiritual home, and indeed our office, is based in Brussels, because the EU remains the primary rulemaking body for us across the region. But the purview of the EACA is much broader than that. We represent the UK, remember them, which we see as a core part of the European industry still, and many other non-EU states as well, which are part of our broader membership. And indeed, as the industry continues to globalize through our Voxcom initiative, of which there are details below, we are increasingly partnering with the organizations like the 4As and the WFA from an advertiser perspective to take the broadest possible view of the issues affecting our industry. Over the next few episodes, we'll be touching on a range of different topics, like sustainability, brand safety, digital taxation, diversity and inclusion, and everyone's favorite subject, I think, the role of procurement in advertising. There are many other things we could discuss, and we'd very much like to hear from you what's on your mind, what are the things that concern you about the business going forward. Please contact us and let us know, and we'll ensure that we cover them in future episodes. Until then, we will see you soon. Welcome to the uh, first uh, episode of Advertising Europe, where we take a view of the core issues affecting our industry across the region. Today, we're going to take a 30,000 foot view of the industry in general, both looking back on three things which have had a big impact on our industry over the last year or two, and also then projecting those forward in terms of what likely effect that will have on our business as we look forward. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, three experts in, the, in a, their field. Uh, Nina Elsa, my colleague from the EACA, who is our Head of Public Affairs and an expert on all things to do with Brussels and the European Commission. Uh, Christiane de Villachet from uh, the Avas Group, who is Global Chief Integration Officer and also a member of the uh, management team of EACA in Europe. Christiane, welcome. Uh, and also Paul Bainsfair, who is the Director General of the IPA, uh, who will be talking about uh, the UK's changed role in Europe and uh, the impact that uh, the Brexit has had on us so far and projecting what that may be uh, going further forward. So, that, so I'm, I'm delighted to have uh, those three guests with us. Let me, uh, let me kick things off perhaps with, uh, with Nina. Uh, Nina, we have, a, um, we have a pretty active and vigorous commission uh, with a big list of things they want to, uh, they want to get done. Um, where are we in terms of the commission and what can uh, those of us in the industry expect over the coming uh, months? Uh, hi, Paul. Yes, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, there's actually a lot of things going on, not only in the Commission, but things have already moved into the European Parliament. So um, I think what's going to happen next year is um, there's going to be a lot of more scrutiny around advertising, placement and dissemination. Um, but let me give you a few examples. Um, so maybe you've heard about these heated debates in the European Parliament around a ban on targeted advertising. So this has been discussed in the context of um, new rules for platforms. Um, so far, uh, we're probably not facing a complete ban on targeted advertising, but probably a ban on targeting to children. And um, also just recently, the Commission has issued a proposal for a regulation on political advertising. And also in there, we see a ban, but only if you target based on sensitive personal data. Um, if you want to do that, you need explicit consent. That's nothing new as compared to the GDPR, so our data protection regulation, but still something to keep in mind. And I'm also mentioning that because it particularly mentions advertising agencies and some transparency requirements for them. Um, a third example, if I may, um, is on disinformation and the role of advertising in that. So we do know that advertising does sometimes inadvertently fund the uh, disinformation content uh, and we also know that agencies are a lot do, uh, doing a lot in the context of brand, brand safety. Um, we as EACA and some of our national association members are signatories to a code of practice on disinformation that came into place uh, in 2018. Um, but now in view of corona and lots of disinformation around that topic, for example, um, the Commission came to the conclusion that the code is not effective anymore, so we're actually reworking this. And also, um, some of our agencies are actively involved in this. 
So in the first quarter of 2022, we will actually draft a new code that should be finalized by the end of March. And the last example is uh, advertising of foods, especially um, looking at foods uh, high in fat, salt, and sugar, and in particular when this targets children. So um, you may know from the UK, there's already something in discussion regarding a ban on advertising to children for these so-called junk foods. Um, but we also see that in Ireland and Spain, and now under the new German um, uh, government, this will also come in Germany. So I do believe that the pressure on the commission will be high to introduce such a ban at EU level. So just that in a nutshell. Okay, Nina, well, there's a lot going on there and a lot to cover, and we will come back to the whole uh, legislative agenda in subsequent episodes of, of Advertising Europe, but I think that's a good overview. I mean, you spent a lot of time in the corridors of power, so to speak, um, wandering around the Commission, lobbying on behalf of, of our members. Some, some people say that the Commission is kind of anti-business, anti-advertising in particular, given that whole list of, of issues that they're addressing. Is, is that a fair characterization? Or is the, is the truth a little more complex than that? I would actually think that the Commission takes a very reasonable view on advertising. I think policymakers are increasingly aware of the fact that a lot of content that uh, people across Europe enjoy on a daily basis is advertising funded. So, for example, take news, independent news as well, um, and games and other apps. So I do think there's an understanding of that. Also the role that advertising plays for SMEs or startups. Um, so I do think that on the side of the commission, there's a lot of understanding for that. And there's no interest in an outright ban, for example, on targeting. I think the, the view is a bit more mixed in the European parliament where we have lots of voices. And as I mentioned before, um, there's a, a very critical view on targeting, profiling, tracking, tracing, and so on. There's a co coalition among MEPs that looks at, at targeting. Uh, and I do believe what will happen in the, in the, next, um, in the next year will be, um, the GDPR will be really the guiding compass for everyone. So um, this is a strong rule. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll have to watch out that compliance uh, with all these rules is, is in place and basically a non-negotiable for, for agencies. Okay, Nina, thanks very much. I, I just wonder at this point, we are going to hear from Paul a little later in terms of the broader situation with regard to Brexit. But this whole sort of legislative agenda and bans and, and the overflow from the rulemaking of Brussels, and in some cases, the UK going ahead of Brussels in some areas. How, how do you see, Paul, that kind of playing out uh, over, the, over the coming months? Well, Paul, it's, um, it's difficult to predict, in all honesty. Um, on the one hand, um, the UK advertising industry, and indeed industry generally in the UK, needs to almost dovetail in with European um, rules and regulations so that we can continue to operate in those markets. So, although we have some freedom to do our own thing, and go our own way, um, and certainly there's been, now you'll be aware of this, there's been some talk of us having a more relaxed view to um, asking for cookie permissions and all that sort of thing popping up ahead of, say, the, the EU. But I think generally, I don't, I don't predict over the course, certainly over the next three to five years, much difference in the way that we operate here to the way that we see our, you know, colleagues in Europe operating in their markets. Um, so it's, um, but it's a phony war sort of period for Brexit, you know, and I'll come on talk about that perhaps when, when we talk in more detail about that issue later. Yeah, thanks, Paul. And that's, that's certainly, I think, our experience trying to operate across the region from my, from my day job here at Ogilvy. Um, you know, we are kind of pretty much soldiering on as best as best we could. Um, OK, well, thank you very much, Nina and Paul. Let me now move on, move on to Christian, who we've asked to, uh, to discuss in particular uh, the impact of COVID. Uh, we are filming this um, programme in December for release in January. And um, I think if we'd had this conversation a week ago, it may have been a little bit different before Oricom uh, burst onto the scene. So I guess it's always gonna be a case of probably one step forward, two steps back, or hopefully two steps forward, one step back as we go forward. Christian, can you just talk a little bit about what the impact in general of the, the pandemic has been on agencies kind of in general, and then perhaps tune in a little bit to what you and your, and your agency group are thinking in terms of how we go forward over the coming months? Well, thank you very much, Paul, for inviting me. And rightly say, when we discussed about this opportunity, I think that was uh, two or three weeks ago, and the world was different. 
let's just remind ourselves what we've been going through. Uh, I mean, we are all experienced enough in, uh, in this forum to have, have faced other crises, but a crisis which was that sudden, that deep, and that long. And when I'm saying that long, I was thinking originally three months, but it's now a year and a half, and we're in the fifth wave or fourth wave, depending on countries. Um, and basically for three months, we really questioned us as an industry, but the world, whether there would be anything positive, com positive coming out of that. People stuck at home, shops closed, nothing and for industry, nothing to buy and nothing to sell. It's difficult where in a commerce industry, you have nothing to sell. So you have no advertisers, uh, no media because people were stuck at home and uh, no one, no one to buy. Uh, and obviously, you know, we didn't know, I think in April, whether we'd be able to pay the bills. And I'm talking about Avast, but I'm sure, you know, it's the same at WPP and all our other companies. When then you look back a year and a half and despite second, third, fourth wave and all the trauma, uh, we have actually managed that as an industry pretty well. At the end of the day, the impact in 2020, I guess, was between minus 10 and minus 15%. I've got friends, I'm sure you have in the tourism industry who are in the minus 60, minus 70, minus 80. And when you look at 2021 now, uh, the catchback is remarkable. And we've, we're seeing growth figures, plus 15, plus 18. I mean, you know, we've never seen that in our whole life, even in the, in the digital world. So all in all, we have, we have managed. What's interesting is the kind of decision we had to take uh, when the pandemic arrived. I mean, when the right, when the decision, uh, at, and I think the first thing we all did, and something we discussed at the ACA many times, is caring for people because people were completely lost from one day to another. And I think it was from a Friday to a Monday, certainly in the UK, France, Belgium. Uh, you had to say the office is closed, and we had to basically move from people working together to people completely isolated from each other. The second thing we had to do is reinvent the office and what it means to work together, which of course uh, will last after the pandemic in a new hybrid model, which has some virtues. And the third thing we had to do is to protect our business and first talk to our client, try to reassure them without anything really positive to tell them, but we are agents of positiveness and change and in the same time, protect our business without, uh, I would say, uh, damaging the fundamentals and the fundamentals in our business is people. And I think, Avas and the others, uh, we're not here to promote anyone. We have done a pretty good job in terms of reinventing the way to work, protecting our clients, who have changed, maybe we will talk about that, and protecting our business. So to have the ability to bounce back uh, and to, survive all these new waves, which are uh, disturbing, destabilizing, and particularly for the people. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I'd almost forgotten those dark days in February and March when the uh, pandemic broke out and where we really did imagine that we were, well, consider we were in an existential crisis of which we, we may never return. And I think, it, as, you, as you point out, you know, it's, it's interesting how similar the, the revenue impact on all of the major groups was, whether you're looking at Publicis, WP, Omnicom, IPG, Avas, that'll do as a list. Um, and I think, you know, they were very consistent because of the scale they have. I think exactly. smaller residency groups, and we have many as, as members of the EACA as well in the region, were much more uh, impacted based on the, on the portfolio of business they had. So that, as you pointed out, you know, in my experience, if you were in the travel business, you had a bit of a problem. Uh, or the drinks business or, you know, entertainment of any kind. If you were in, uh, you know, pharma, obviously business was, was looking pretty good at the extremes of the, of the overall piece. So, so do you think that, um, that the kind of um, the psychology of agencies in terms of how they face future crises has changed fundamentally as a result of this? Because it sounds, sounds like you're suggesting we're more robust perhaps going forward than perhaps we were when we naively uh, first heard about COVID. Well, it's, it's very much linked to what you said we have been protected in a way by the diversity of the sectors we are communicating for and the diversity of the disciplines 
that we are actually uh, having. You know, when we started our, our business uh, 30 years ago, uh, basically uh, it was a, a big and main media. Today, uh, the consulting has grown in importance and I was convinced consulting would suffer. Actually, uh, all the contrary, because of the big buzzword of digital transformation, all clients have had to accelerate their digital transformation. Who did they turn to? Consultant. Uh, digital experience, because they had to invent new channel of connection with their customer. And to the contrary, traditional media, creative advertising, PR to a certain extent, have suffered most. So by this hybridation of a lot of disciplines, we have been protected. I think that has created, to your question, a certain degree of resi resilience, a certain degree of confidence from the people within the industry, because they are not just stuck in one silo, who either uh, sky uh, roofed or actually uh, collapsed. Uh, also, I think we, we have invented a new way of communicating for our clients. I think uh, everyone realized that with the global warming and the pandemic, you cannot today uh, not contribute to the society. And people are expecting you to actually make the world a better place. We do uh, at Avas every year, or every two years, actually, a big worldwide study, Meaningful Brand. And the key fact, we interview uh, 300,000 people uh, in 30 countries. The only very changing and dramatic fact uh, of this year is that 75% people, percent of the people say, we expect brands to contribute to make the world a better place that would have never been that kind of figure two years ago. And therefore the marketing, and even I would say the management of the company has changed. And it has given more importance to the communication agencies to help clients shape their purpose, redefine their raison d'etre, define a real program to act positively uh, for the world. Yesterday, uh, we were very uh, lucky to be uh, awarded the, the, the network of the year. And I said, you know, you can't be effective today without being meaningful. And I think clients realize they need to put more meaning behind what they do. And I think it gives a lot of strength and a lot of energy, positive energy to our industry because we can contribute really. And we've always been, uh, you know, shamed for doing the bad things. I think we can be for once rewarded for doing the right things. Let's hope so. Well, well thank you, Christian. There's a, there's a whole load of issues you've covered there, and I think uh, we will come back to those purpose, you know, how brands play a role in the world going forward and how agencies can affect that in subsequent episodes of, of Advertising Europe. So we'll come back to that. But uh, thank you very much for those comments. Also, you've proven yourself to be a true advertising man by getting your Euro Effie Award out there today as well. And, and <laughs> I'm glad for that, so congratulations. Uh, that's a great achievement. It was a great event yesterday, by the way. Um, the Euro Effie's carried on. Uh, in spite of COVID, which is uh, good to know. I'm going to come on now to, uh, to talk to Paul Bainsfair, who um, is Director General of the I IPA, which is actually the largest member in terms of the, uh, of the uh, agency groups, of the associations that we have. And I, I would like to take this opportunity to make it very clear that whilst Brexit may have happened, the EACA and the uh, IPA are working as closely together as ever. And in fact, they're all, the IPA are also a core part of the Voxcom initiative that our Director General Tamara is pushing forward, that brings the four A's, the IPA, and many of the other industry associations around the world together to tackle some of these broader issues, because obviously our industry is increasingly global, uh, as are our clients. So, so Paul, I think um, before we dive into the, the uh, dreaded subject of Brexit, which you and I have been discussing, and you and I were together, I think, in Cannes the morning after, uh, after the results, and uh, I don't think we'll, neither of us will ever forget that. Uh, but um, that's a while ago now. But I guess um, maybe I could ask you just to start as, as a very large member organization speaking to agencies every day, maybe to pick up on some of the trends that, um, that Christian was talking about. How, how do you assess kind of where agencies are right now in general terms uh, in the midst of the COVID crisis? Well, Christian, I think, spoke very well about the recovery that we weren't expecting after the, pan the pandemic. Um, and that's certainly been the case in the UK. Um, that, that said, I think the recovery has um, opened up a, a whole other problem area, which is what I think most people are calling the talent crisis. Um, so when we were in those dark days, 18 months, nearly worse, getting on for 
more than that now, isn't it, uh, ago, um, there were, you know, there was only one way agencies could react to the, um, you know, the rather gloomy future that they were looking at, and that was to cut their costs. And as we all know, if you're running an advertising business, your main cost line, it's your people. So a lot of people were let go. Um, and it seems that a lot of people that were let go have taken a decision not to come back into the industry. You know, they've reevalued what they want from their lives and what they want from their jobs. And I think we lost, we lost a lot of talented people at that time. And now that we're seeing this, um, you know, rather interesting, de you know, demand curve going up in terms of what's, what, what's expected from agencies, it's a struggle to find people to do all the jobs. Um, and that in itself is posing a problem, I know not just in the UK, but in many other markets. And I know um, from talking to the four A's in, in the States, it's, the problem's even more acute over there. So that's a big issue for us. Um, Another big issue, again, Christian mentioned it in passing, um, is climate change. And more and more uh, of our industry, I don't just include the ag agencies here, I'm talking about the media owners, I'm talking about the clients, are look, putting this to the front of their agenda and looking at what changes we might need to make and how we can make changes uh, over the coming years to get to um, you know, an ad net zero sort of position. Um, and we have a project running across our whole industry, which I'm very much involved with. Um, and I know the EACA have become more and more aware of this because we've been talking to Tamara about it, which is how we reduce carbon footprints in terms of advertising production, but also in terms of the advertising that we run and our own businesses. So that's a big issue for us as well. But um, by and large, I would say they're, they're the things that are occupying most of, uh, most of the uh, conversations that, that we have with agencies at the moment. Okay, great. And again, I think plenty of, uh, plenty of raw material there for some subsequent uh, Advertising Europe discussions, you know, diving into those issues in detail, because they're certainly a part of all of our world right now. So uh, we can delay it no longer. Uh, let us come to the uh, dreaded Brexit issue. We're, 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 and I think we've seen, you know, in, in so many areas, financial services being one, uh, fishing is possibly the more extreme one that's come to the top of the agenda. But, you know, the, the pandemic seems to have delayed and obfuscated to some extent the impact of some of these, uh, of the impact of Brexit. Um, you know, myself, and I guess this is true of most of us on the call here, were I was traveling two or three days a week on average pre-COVID. Uh, I think I've made one business trip since then. So, you know, I, I don't really experience any of the border issues that I perhaps would have if I were carrying on, carrying on with my business as I was before. I have to say a couple of uh, personal trips have been rather more painful than they were otherwise. So I think um, there's, been, there's probably been some delay, but what are you seeing and what are you expecting in terms of impact, particularly from the, from the UK end of the, of the Brexit spectrum? Yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, it still feels like a bit of a phony war and it's been extended by the, uh, the pandemic. Um, but it's important to keep things into perspective. I mean, there's a, for, the, for, for those of you that you know, are not in the UK, I might, I might stress that the whole issue of Brexit remains a very big, hot, controversial topic in the UK. Um, and those that voted leave uh, and those that voted remain, remain almost implacably opposed to this day. There's a little bit of um, there's a little bit of talk about well it's been done now on on the Remain side and we and we need to get on with it but it's not it doesn't have any real energy behind it there's still this sort of um, long term kind of miserableness amongst half of the population um, but as I said we've got to keep it in perspective you know all these debates about about um, various different industry sectors not our own I mean fishing someone said to me that the turnover of the fishing industry. Uh, in the UK is less than the wage bill of Chelsea Football Club, you know, so it's a tiny, tiny industry. I mean, it's important to the people that are in it, obviously, but these things get blown up and they, they take an, an enormous amount of time and they add and fuel, the co you know, the controversy around what has happened. But the, um, I would say at the moment, and I'm really echoing what you said, Paul, most of the problems are practical complicating problems rather than anything serious that's getting in the way of our industry and how it operates. Indeed, um, I was quite surprised to discover that our international trade and exports in advertising services in the UK continues to grow despite the fact that Brexit, well, I think the vote happened five years ago, um, and it's growing at about 7% a year. Now, this is the whole of the world, and it's worth about 11 billion pounds to the UK economy. 
and makes it one of the most important and vibrant service sectors within the UK economy. So if you look at the, the sort of macro numbers, Brexit doesn't seem to have had that much effect on advertising in the UK now. And that's not to say that we're not going to see further problems down, downstream. And in the, in the near future, we've all seen in the UK supply problems, supply side problems caused by shortage of heavy goods vehicle drivers and things like that, things being held up in ports. Um, these just add to the frustration, but they don't really change the overall picture, which on the whole remains fairly healthy. So I would say that um, it's too soon to judge, but you know, many of us would prefer not to have the problem, but it's probably not going to be, you know, talking about you know, existential problems. It's not an existential problem to the UK. It's still a massive economy. It's still, advertising is still one of the most, I suppose, one of the things we're world-class at and continue to be seen to be very good at it around the world. So, um, I mean, partly in hope, but also expectation, I think that, you know, the UK advertising industry will continue to thrive over, over the coming years. Thanks, Paul. I mean, let, let's hope so. And I think, you know, in a way, you're echoing many of the points that Christian made about the, you know, the opportunity, in a way, that the current situation has had for agencies to really add value in areas that, were in the, the, the perhaps needed more than they have been in the past. So I think that's a positive. Uh, I think we're not the BBC here, so we don't have to be entirely neutral um, in terms of our view on Brexit. Uh, my views were pretty well uh, well known, I think, uh, at the time, but it is what it is. And I think for all our members, we have to we have to do our best in terms of pushing forward. Just one, one further thought, and it's not something I'm deeply familiar with myself, but the production end of our industry, you know, a, a lot of production has obviously been done digitally and virtually during the uh, during the crisis, uh, to an astonishing degree, actually, in terms of the quality of things that have been produced. But at you know on location shoots where one used to jump on a train from the UK and go to I don't know Austria, Switzerland, and film something with a crew, almost on a whim. Now I understand there are all kinds of potential, um, you know, forms that need to be filled in, rights that need to be garnered, particularly if one's working on a multi-market basis. Are you hearing anything on that regard from the from the production businesses? Mm. Yeah, it's um, it's true that um, that's the case. However, it's also true that when you mention um, you know virtual productions, we are learning and applying more and more stuff from the from the gaming industry about how to create virtual um, production locations. Uh, so more of that is happening. There's also the other um, the other sort of um, pressure which I mentioned, which is um, reacting to climate change. And there's tremendous pressure on the issue of foreign travel anyway, um, because that's one of the biggest contributors to carbon. Um, so I think there is, a, there is going to be a move away from the frequency unquestionably of overseas productions that won't end completely. Um, and indeed, um, some of the, um, some of the ways in which we're able to work despite Brexit with our European um, colleagues means that if, say, you were making, a, I don't know, a car commercial and, it, and the best location for that was, you know, the south of France or whatever it would be, you would just give it to your French agency to, you know, to do the production with supervision from the creating agency if it were happened to be in London. So it's it's not that difficult to get round, but, it, you know, it's a it's an unnecessary problem, as I said earlier. But... I think you're right. I think it is a problem, and I think we will see less of these big production numbers going around the world, particularly and to, to a lesser extent in Europe, than we used to see. But it, but it won't mean that we won't see big, spectacular commercials because there are other ways of doing it. Let's hope so. Um, Just one, word, one word on that. I think you sure. know, uh, this crisis is, uh, you know, changing a paradigm. I think we've all lived in the nice to have world. And now we live in the must do uh, rather than the nice to have. And we realize that a lot of things to what Paul was saying uh, that we were used to, we don't necessarily have to do it uh, to compromise with the quality, with the service, with the pleasure uh, of, of doing it. And sometimes it is shaking our habits and we don't like it. But I think we should, you know, it's the beginning of uh, beginning old, so we should challenge ourselves and think: Is it and is there a better way to connect with your uh, with your peers? You said I didn't travel. I think we need to refine a balance. Huh? Of course, not every day like we were doing, but maybe not once a year. 
uh, in terms of shooting, in terms of working together at the office. We are moving from, you know, I would say habits to necessity, and it has some values, positive. Values. I would agree with that, Christian. And in fact, I, I want to recommend a book that uh, has been written by Adam Morgan, not by me, which is called A Beautiful Constraint, A Beautiful Constraint. And in the book, a very recently published book, he looks at all of the great um, steps forward in, in the world, all of the great innovations and how so many of them were caused by not being able to do what you could do before. So, you know, I'm echoing your point. I think the book does it much in a much better way than I can. But out of this, out of this situation, there will be good things. There will be good, better ways of doing things that emerge, unquestionably. Well, I think that's a wonderful point on which to uh, conclude the uh, first ever issue of Advertising Europe. Uh, I mean, I think we, we could go on for some time, I think. These are broad issues, and we will, I, I promise you, come back to them in, in subsequent episodes. But I think that, that creates a great framework on which to start the new year. And I think also it means we end on a slightly positive note in terms of how these constraints can uh, improve us and drive us forward um, as we go. So we will link up that book. Uh, we will link up also the, um, the Voxcom initiatives that, that are taking place and some of the other stuff uh, in terms of the uh, commissions uh, core agenda items uh, in the piece below. Um, and thank you to uh, Nina, to Christian and to Paul for participating in this first episode. Uh, we will see you again soon with, uh, with the next one. Other than that, thank you very much.